Stream, 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 stream starting soon. Stream starting soon. Green starting soon.
one. Oh, didn't have the mic on. If y'all can hear me, please let me know in the comments. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, who all we got out there today? I see Brian. Hello, Brian. I think Hannah Rellet told me she was getting on. I am Fisher. Dad left his home, his phone at home. So Bono Baptist Church it is. Hello, everyone from the Seavers family. Hello, Seavers. You know who it is. It's Tate. Yes, Tate. I know that you are identifying as your mom. The boys say hi. Hello, boys. Hello. You can hear me, but only when I talk. Thanks, Brian. That's very, very good to be able to have that, um, that confidence there. Yes, thank you for that. Miss Kathy, good Wednesday evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hannah Rowlett says she can hear me. All right, very good, very good. Okay, how's everybody doing? If you could chime in the chat real quick how you're doing. We'll get our game loaded up here. Yes, Hannah, I acknowledge that I figured you were on. No worries there. Boys say hi, hello boys. I think I already said that. Uh, so we've got Will Russell's on, which is Fisher. Le Toast says beep beep lettuce. Maggie, so your kids are on. Julie's on. Brian doing the dab. And Tate says he's doing good. We got Hannah Rallett out there. The Seavers family out there. Sweet. Glad everybody's doing good. All right. Get this going. All right, this evening I have a challenge for you all. This is called Reverse Spelling Bee. So we'll do a few rounds of this and then we'll let Brother Will do his thing. He's not on camera right now, but he will be joining me. So this is Reverse Spelling Bee. Um, gonna be a little tricky. You'll have to type this in the comments and we'll see who's, who's right or wrong here. So how this works is I'm going to give you an example here on your screen. There is a picture of a saw, 
but it's reverse. So you have to say what this word would be in reverse, okay? So we'll do an example here. All right, so this is was. So instead of saying, hey, that saw, S-A-W, it would be was. So I hope that this uh, makes sense to you all. And we will get going. All right, this is for real now. So you see the picture? And you need to put in the comments what you think this is in reverse. It's a reverse spelling bee. Okay. Got a little bit of a lag again, so. Don't want the nice red chair. Mm. Alright, we've got Maggie chiming in with this will be God. Okay. God, God, God. Man, look at all you people taking God's name in vain. Throwing Profanity. God out there like that, man. This is a church channel. What's going on with that? Alright. Alright, kind of an easy one. The answer is God. Okay? Here we go. Got a picture of that's probably inappropriate for it. <laughs> Got a picture of some weaponry there. All right, so you know what the word is, but what is it backwards? What is this word backwards? Throw it in the comments if you think you know it. Anna says she's on her computer but listening to us on the iPad. Very cool. That that just expresses your technological savviness. All right. So Julie says this word is snug. Could be. Amanda Seaver says nugs. Nugs. Maggie with snugs. Kathy Braun says this is definitely snug. All right, answer is snug, snug singular. So very close. I think most of you got it. Next one here, we have a picture. What is this word backwards? Give you guys a moment here. Okay, everybody's saying rats. Rats. Hmm. Like darn it rats. Okay. Answer is, of course, rats. Good job. What do we have here? Well, that messed up. That messed up. Hold on, everybody. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'm messing myself up here. This, do this, back to normal, back to normal. Yes, I messed up on that one. The answer was going to be warts. We'll move on to the next one. All right, here's this little uh, demon dude here. What do we think the answer is here? <laughs> oh. 
people are throwing in mom comments. Yo, mama. Maggie says, mom says, ew. I'm probably in reference to, to warts. And, um, or rats. And then looks like Tate says, yo, mama. So, all right. What do we think this is here? We've got Brian saying it's lived. Interesting. Hannah Rowlett lived. Kathy lived. Maggie was lived. Everybody chiming in with lived here. Okay. So, any other guesses? Level. Tate says level. Like Laville. Is that French? Is that Laville? All right, we'll do five, four, three, two, one, lived. It is lived or lived as some cultures say. He lived, like you lived streamed. Is that how you would say live stream? In the past, you lived stream? Good question. Maybe you lived stream. Maybe, Maybe you lived stream, that's right. All right, here's your next one. Kathy Braun says she cannot hear me anymore. Can anyone else hear me? Testing. Anyone hear me? Mike shows it's good. All right. What we got going on here? Anyone? Okay. Interesting answer. Hannah Rowlett, she says pals, that this means pals, okay. It is, my friend Mitch is on with a very epic and mysterious comment. He says, it is for the condemned. All right, <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, I get it. In reference to Brian's comment, was that Cupid? And he's saying it is for the condemned, meaning they will see the devil. Very interesting there, Mitch. All right, we've got... Brian says this is pals. Okay, Hannah says they can hear me good. Uh, Miss Kathy, I'm not sure. Uh, sounds like the mic's working. Maybe check check something on your... Well, if she can't hear me, she can't hear me. She asking can't. her. <laughs> so, all right. Maybe your sign language. Yeah. Okay, we've got uh, Maggie saying, yo, mama. <laughs> she says, pals. P-O-W-L-S. Fisher says, pals. P-A-L-S. Maggie says, pals. Oh, that's in your way. My bad. And, all right. We took a minute on that one. Let's see what it is. So there was obviously they were slapping, so it's a slap in reverse. It's pals. Good job on pals. All right, now we got some spoons here. What do we think spoons is backwards? Tonight, I'm afraid. Snoops, Snoops. I'll have to set up for next time. No big deal. So this will work though. All right. Now Fisher with a different answer. He says this is spoils. Spoils. Maggie with Snoop. Ah, Julie says Snoop Dog. Mm. You spelt it wrong though, Julie. It has to be D A W G. All right. Anyone else venture a guess? A little wager here. All right, answer is Snoops. Snoops. I guess that would be Snoop Dogg's nickname. They just call him Snoops. Snoops, all right. 
Good job. We got some feet here. Okay, what is this? What is the reverse of what you think this word is? The reverse of what you think this word is. Give y'all a moment, momentary notice here. Sir, very well, thank you. You seem sort of very solemn. I'm trying to get my pre lesson nap in. Ah, good old pre lesson nap. All right, Let's see what we got going on. We've got swap. Hannah was swap. Christy or that's uh, Tate was swap. Brian was swap. Fisher and Maggie with swap. We've got my friend Mitch. This cat. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mitch. Mitch, my friend. I think you misunderstand the point of the game. I probably didn't explain it well enough. Because I think I see where you're going there. You're thinking that those are a dog's feet. So you're thinking probably, well, the opposite of a dog is a cat. So you're saying cat. However, uh, that is not the objective. So what you want to do is you want to isolate what you think this word is. Let's say you thought the word was dog. Well, the opposite of dog is God, so you would say God rather than cat. I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, so Julie says it's wife swap, celebrity edition. Oh, how did we get in on this? I don't know where this is going. All right, so. All right, the answer is swap. Good job. Good job, one and all. Swap. So, Mitch, my friend. I didn't want to reveal the answer, but you can see what's going on here. The word was pause, P-A-W-S. So what you want to do is say, well, that word backwards is S-W-A-P, swap. Therefore, that is the answer. All right, moving on. What's this here? You know what it is, but what is the word backwards? Mitch says, and this is him saying it. All right, so your wife can't come down on this. He says, I'm Methodist, I make my own rules. <laughs> yeah, my friend Mitch in true form. I love it. Glad you're here, friend. <laughs> All right, so what do we think this word is backwards? You know what the word is, but what is it backwards? Hannah with repaid. Repaid. Interesting. Repaid. Uh, well, Brian with repaid. All right, everybody says repaid. Okay. Repaid, repaid. Let's see what the answer is. And sure enough, good job, those of you that chimed in there. It is repaid. Did you know that backwards of diapers repaid? Did I know that? So it's as if the child is repaying you for the diaper. That's right. All right, this may be our last one. What do we got here, and what's the word backwards? <laughs> My friend Mitch says that was emergency PPE, personal <laughs> protective equipment. If you do not own a face mask, you can grab a diaper and put it over your face. It will protect you enough for the moment. 
I mean, if it, you know, he's actually onto something. If it, so. if it will stop you ingesting contaminated saliva, I mean, excuse me, if it catches baby's bathroom happenings, then you would think it, it you know? It would protect you. I mean, it obviously going to stop saliva from coming in. Mitch, you're you're onto something, man. Yeah, I mean that's gross, but you're onto something. Yeah, just not a, a a used one. Yeah, just not a used one. He says. All right, so Brian says this word is stressed. Hannah was stressed. Hannah, are you just waiting for Brian to answer and then you're giving your answer? That's what I feel like you're doing here. I'm just kidding. I know you're smart, Hannah. Everybody else was stressed. 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 Mm, Maggie was stressed. Fisher was stressed. All three of your kids was stressed. All right. And the answer is stressed. Ooh, we're on our last one. We'll do it real quick. Turn it over to Brother Will. You good with that? It takes a couple minutes. Okay, last one here. Tricky one there. Uh, Julie says that is her constantly. Sorry to hear that, Julie. We don't want you to be stressed all the time. Yeah, Brian has called Hannah an answer thief. That sounds accurate. That sounds very accurate, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. All right. Okay, what do we think this is here? Last one. Haha, <laughs> I didn't even get this one. I just now had to kind of read the comments and think about it. Okay. Ah, Jimmy Miller, good to see you. See you're on now. All right, so I won't lie. This one threw me for a curve for just a second. Okay. All right, so, yeah. Oh, uh, Hannah says Brian's the answer thief. She's been answering first, and she does the dab. Julie says, vroom, vroom, I'm in me mom's car. <laughs> so Julie's mom drives like she's in a race car. Yeah, this is a little tricky. Uh, the word is race car, and did you know that race car backwards is race car? Mm -hmm. So Dody that's it. Dody Dilly Dom is the word for that. What'd you say? Dody Diddy Dom. What? Dody Diddy Dom. That's called a Dody Diddy Dom? Is that real? You just want me to say Dody Diddy Dom on camera. <laughs> that's. Wow. <laughs> Dody Diddy <laughs> Dom. Uh, I'm glad you're real proud of yourself for that one. I fell right into it, though. I deserve that. Totally deserve that. Yeah. Well. Hmm. Doty Diddy Dong. That was a Vine reference. Is that what that is? <laughs> I don't know. It's my... Oh, you just made that up on the fly? That's really funny. I feel burned, but like I'm impressed. Like I'm burned and I'm I'm like mildly hurt by it. But the cleverness of that outweighs any pain I feel. So that that's a solid burn. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Hannah says nice brother Will. Yeah. All right, folks. Um we had just a brief shenanigans game tonight and I'll go ahead and tell you next week since it is now officially summer. Next week I have a nailed it or failed it pool party edition. So it'll be people around the pool party, and we're going to do some did they nail it or did they fail the move that they're going to do around the swimming pool. So please join us for that one. You can get the kids involved on that. It'll give them something fun to guess. Um, all right, well, with that, Brother Will, we'll bring you in. Um, special guest this evening. Kind of pan over a little. Um, I think you're violating my six feet. Yeah, probably kidding. so. I'm just totally kidding. But you know. Totally kidding. That's actually it. That's on my list of things to mention tonight, so yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. All right. Uh, I'm joined with 
our senior pastor, Brother Will. And he's going to lead up our lesson this evening. And, yeah, turn it over to you. All right, good deal. Thank you very much, Brother Dustin, and the viewing world out there, wherever you might be. Um, I want to come tonight and share with you um, a few passages of scripture. I promised everyone we would kind of give you a biblical framework for the decisions we've made as a church and why we are going to abide by certain guidelines and why we feel that's important. And so that is the goal for this evening. Um, I will tell you up front that uh, the passages of scripture that I'd like to cover, we will not be able to uh, kind of expositionally cover every detail and go very uh, in depth in all of the meaning, I'm going to leave much undone, and I'm telling you that up front so you can go back and look at it on your own. I will just get to the bare bones of what we need because I want to try to get all three passages in this evening. So um, let me have a word of prayer just to ask God's blessing upon this time of study, and we'll just kind of jump into some things. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and how you guide our lives through your word, the principles of your scripture. And I just ask now that you'd illuminate our understanding and help us, Lord, to uh, learn and just gain some insights that might help us in this COVID-19 existence now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, um, church family, you know that we're supposed to meet back in person indoors this coming Sunday. Um, and there are certain guidelines that we will ask you to abide by. Um, protocols that are meant to safeguard your well-being and the well-being of others. Um, most of those have been published in video form, and you're probably familiar with those. Some of you have probably gotten the, the print version of the newsletter. If you haven't, it should be coming. And in that, it'll explain these as well. Um, one thing Brother Dustin mentioned is the bubble, the six feet of social distancing that we do not observe right here. And, and we will ask you to observe that. Um, Brother Dustin, you can think of some other top guidelines we're throwing out at people? If you don't mind, just real quick, I don't want to overlook anyone. Um, Amanda Seavers says that Anna has said, quote, hey, it's Brother Will. Hi, Brother Will. I do not like your beard. Brother Will, goodbye now. Anyway, sorry, I know well, it's... That's, that's I, not, just, I don't want to overlook anyone. You know, I, I, I do appreciate that. And Anna, I love you, girl. Beard and all. Yeah, so, so yeah. Anyway. Mm. Um, you mentioned the six feet and the mask i don't know if i did okay i, I don't think you mentioned mask. did not mention mask i think you just i didn't know i didn't i haven't mentioned anything okay i hesitated to say that because i didn't know how far you were going yet yeah just a brief run through of some things we're going to require out of people um i think uh uh the bullet do you want me to mention all the bullet points for sure me? go ahead run through so you mentioned in your ex explanatory video of course, social distancing, which I think everybody's had that term beaten so many times they know mm -hmm. what that is. I guess there, though, the rule is if you're going to do your socializing, uh, that's outside. Mm -hmm. So what the ask is when you enter the doors to be cognizant of the social distancing, and then we're going to have ushered guided seating, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to be met with ushers and greeters, and there will be designated seating probably based on family size yes I'm guessing based on area um, and then face mask we ask that you wear the face mask mm -hmm. and then you mentioned in your video another good point is to in case there's any questions wear the face mask during the service yes is that right yes and then we will dismiss in a guided fashion by like rows or section right okay Absolutely. and then one way in one way out right like yes. the main door so Yes. Um, I think that was your bulleted kind of points from your video. Thank you very much. And um, some, some have asked, well, where do you get that? Well, obviously the government recommends that, but how do you get to the point where you decide what you're going to do, how you're going to do, because not every church does the same thing. Well, I, I shared with you church uh, a few Sundays back um, in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and really flowing over to chapter 22, we read um, about a priest named Ahimelech who varies from the ritual practice of the holy bread and he gave it to David and I won't go back through all that you've heard that but in that passage God revealed to us 
four criteria that you really should consider when making changes in the church, adding, deleting, or changing anything to your practice. The, the first thing is inquiring of God. Uh, you must inquire of God as you progress through adding things or deleting things or putting in guidelines or ignoring guidelines, whatever you want to say. So we inquired of God, and we've done much of that. We've inquired of God through this whole process, um, asking him to lead us in, in these uh, times and with these type things. Secondly, we saw that you have to weigh everything against God's standard of holiness. And we don't want to do anything that violates God's holy standards or his expectation of holiness. And so as we progressed forward into determining how do we meet together, it's been done in, in kind of in consideration of how do we maintain God's holy expectations. Thirdly, we want to ensure the worship of God. We can't do anything to diminish or detract from the worship of God, and we have to find those ways that allows us the, the best avenue to worship. And so that's been a consideration. And then finally, we're seeking the best avenue for ministry. We've had to make changes. Um, that's just been inevitable. And those things have been changed to enhance our ability to conduct ministry, to conduct gospel ministry. And so those four things have gone into every consideration as church leaders we've had to consider and things we've decided to do. Now, we've decided to abide by certain guidelines and they're the guidelines recommended by our civil authorities. But biblically, how can I tell you it's okay or that we should follow such guidelines? Well, that's what we want to do tonight. And we're going to start in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Um, the first four verses. Um, and quite honestly, uh, before I read those, I want to back up to uh, chapter 1 and just read a verse out of chapter 1. It's verse 27. Uh, here the Bible says, as soon as I find it, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so... The Apostle Paul calls the church at Philippi to be of one spirit, of one mind, to strive together, to be in unity. And chapter 2, then, we get to this text, which builds off of chapter 1, where Paul says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So here we have a pivotable, pivotable, that word, text in this. I did make up a word in the last video, by yeah. the way. Intergaged. Intergaged is a new word. Y'all keep your uh, eyes and ears tuned for it. This passage starts out by saying, therefore, referring back to the previous statement, if there is any consolation. And that terminology doesn't really give us the most accurate rendering. It's really because there is consolation in Christ, because there is comfort of love, because there is fellowship of the Spirit. So... There we have a more accurate rendering of that text because we have consolation in Christ and because we have the comfort of his love, because we have the fellowship of the Spirit, because we have affection and mercy. We fulfill Paul's joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind, and moving on to being uh, letting go of selfish conceit and moving on to esteem others better, and we'll get there. So tonight, I want us to, to put this in light of COVID-19 guidelines. <clears throat> Why do we abide by these as a church? Why is this important for you and I as church members, as Christians who are going to come to worship together, to abide by these things? Well, here, uh, Paul calls for, calls for unity among the church. Christians are, are to promote unity in the body. We're to be of one accord and of one mind. Um, Really, the causes of a weak and dysfunctional church tend to be those things which lead to discord, disharmony, and conflict, division in the body. Those things lead to a weak church, a dysfunctional church. And can I tell you that COVID-19, the response to COVID-19, 
the views in regard to safety protocols, it's been very polarizing, even among Christians. We have, even within our church, people who believe certain things about the guidelines and people believe other things about the guidelines and so on and so forth. And I want you to be mindful that that which leads to discord, disharmony, conflict, or division in the body weakens the church and brings dysfunction to the church, yet we're called to be unified as a body. And so we must guard ourselves from allowing differing, different different opinions over these guidelines and uh, protocols to introduce conflict dysfunction into our church. We're called to be unified. And here in Philippians, the Apostle Paul is addressing matters uh, that are largely matters of personal choice. These aren't doctrinal things by and large. They're not theological things by and large. They're matters of personal choice that he's asking the church to guard against so that they don't introduce disunity, dysfunction into the body. And so I want you to know that we see right through here, and once again, let me remind you, I'm not going in depth, I'm not doing it justice, I'm giving you kind of the skip and the rock across the service. We see here that we all have experienced the grace of God through the work of Christ. We have each come to know the consolation of Christ, a comfort of Christ, and a compassion of Christ. Those three things are named right there at the beginning of this text. Consolation, comfort, and compassion. We've all experienced those things from Christ, and now we in turn are supposed to demonstrate demonstrate those things to each other, and they become unifying agents among the believers. When we are practicing a consolation towards one another, a comfort towards one another, a compassion towards one another, those three things become pillars of unity in the body of Christ. And the, the text here mentions some very pointed and specific things that give us justification for this in our lives. It says we have the fame, uh, or excuse me, same fellowship of the Spirit. Uh, Brother Dustin, what's that spark in your mind, the same fellowship of the Spirit? Uh, it, to me, it sparks that I believe what Paul is getting at in context. He's, he's telling them about how we are united in Christ. And I believe he's going a step further to say, so we all have the same Holy Spirit as well residing in our hearts. So there should be this comfort and consolation and love sort of because there is a common fellowship we have, not just in Christ, but it's the same Spirit working in you that's working in me that's working in, in everyone else. I'm not sure if that's what No, that's great. At, but... That's great because it, it reminds you of Paul's words in Romans where he speaks of the love of God being poured out in our hearts. It's the same love we each have been imparted with, the same spirit that indwells us, the same character of Christ we're being drawn and grown into. Um, as we have the same identity in Christ through the same spirit. And it's that identity we have in Christ that gives us incentive to be active in the practice of consolation. Now, that's not a word we use other than a consolation prize, you know, but that's not exactly the meaning here. It really means to come alongside and give aid and comfort. To receive consolation from Christ we have seen him come alongside us and give us aid and comfort in our wicked and deplorable sinful state. Through faith in him, we've been imparted with his spirit that his spirit has come alongside of us, lifted us up and given us aid and comfort. And now we as his followers, as Christians, imparted with his spirit are to come alongside each other to give aid in this time. And so apply that to COVID-19. Apply that to the guidelines we're asking to abide by. You may not particularly agree with all of them, but because of the Spirit of Christ in you, drawing you to practice consolation or come alongside your brother or sister in Christ to give them aid in their time of need, that's a way to practice this. You abide by certain guidelines because you want to come along and be a support, a nurturer, a helper, a lender of aid in the lives of others. And it mentions here also the love that... Christ has imparted to us and that love that we've experienced that has been a demonstration of his comfort in our lives and through his love we have been comforted through the love poured out in the Holy Spirit we've received comfort and how we should comfort one another in our distresses as Christ has comforted us in our distress and so here we have this COVID-19 existence for the church where we have safety protocols in place and because of the love that's been poured into me that comes out of me, I want to lend comfort 
to those in distress and need in regard to COVID-19. And so I may feel perfectly safe sitting next to someone right here in their bubble, but he may not. And if I'm going to provide comfort to him in his need in COVID-19, then I would be mindful of that. That's just an example. And it really comes down to the character of Christ becoming tangible in our lives. How can the character of Christ become a tangible expression that people experience from me? Well, the scripture here mentions affection and mercy. Affection and mercy. And ultimately, Christ has demonstrated affection and a mercy to it, and a mercy. Boy, I'm good tonight. Yeah, that's three, I am get, that's three I'm words. getting on. I am getting on three it tonight. Words you've invented. Y'all keep. We're going to write our own thesaurus up here. We're going to in a new lexicon. So, affection and mercy has been poured out upon us from Christ. And that same character should be known in our lives directed towards others and affection and mercy. There's a word for that. It's called compassion. I should be compassionate towards others. And so if I'm going to promote the unity of the church, I have to do the work of consolation, of providing comfort, but then I have to be compassionate. I have to demonstrate compassion to those around me who will gather to worship with me. And a way to demonstrate compassion is abiding by safety protocols that are in place. Even, even if I think they are worthless and won't protect anyone, if it does bring peace of mind to someone because I'm compassionate towards them, I abide by those things. That's where we're getting at. Consolation, comfort, and compassion. Pillars of unity in the church. We see those in the first two verses. But those two or those three things then in the first two verses take on flesh in the last two verses in verse three and four. Consolation, comfort, and compassion take on form and become active in verses 3 and 4. There the Bible says that nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also the interest of others. You see, as Christians, we're to be unselfish. We are to be unselfish. We have to let go, it says, let go of selfish ambition and conceit. Now, selfishness, if you haven't realized this, it's a natural part of who we are. It is part of the sin nature. In fact, it is probably the root of sin. Selfishness, when we speak of being selfish, we're talking about persistently seeking personal gain or advancement regardless of how it affects others. And Paul here says, let nothing be done that way. Let go of it. Do not function with those parameters in place. The reality is even the most sound of churches can be destroyed by the sin of selfishness when it infiltrates the members and they function that way in the body. See, none of us can exhibit the character of Christ if we're consumed and focusing on pleasing only ourselves or gaining our own glory. So the Bible says here, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. If I'm going to live out the character of Christ, I have to let go of that. Now, I didn't read it, but Brother Dustin, I know you're familiar with if we were to keep, keep on reading here in Philippians 2. That, that whole next section gives us an illustration of what it means to let go of selfishness. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give us a summary there? Uh, yeah, I think it starts down in verse 5 when he says, have this mind in you. Yes. And the summary is, Paul gives an example. So he says all this stuff that you're saying. Here's the teaching. And then he sums it all up with, here's one big example that should end all debate as to, but how do I do this? And so he says, look at the example of Jesus Christ. He is God, yet set aside the full glory that he had in heaven as God and took upon human flesh, born to a low-income family. And so his example is, if you look at the entire life of Jesus, from setting aside glory in heaven to born in the manger to death on the cross, that whole existence he had as a human was ultimate humility. Um, he set aside everything rightfully due him for the sake of the entire human race. Very, very right. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say, so I'm glad you said it for oh, me. I'm, I'm, I read your notes. That's where I got it. No, I appreciate that. But uh, so there's our example 
of, of letting go of selfish ambition and conceit, taking on a lowliness of mind and esteeming others. There's the perfect example. You know, the reality is, my friends, when I only do what I want to do or I only do what pleases myself, that is selfishness and that is sin. I mean, let's think about some sinners we know about. No, don't call them out loud. Don't put their name up on the, on the comments. Mitch, don't put them in the comments. Don't That's put right. me in the comments. But by seeking to please himself, by seeking his selfish will above God's will, Satan fell. There's sin. Doing what I want to do, doing what pleases me, seeking my selfish gratification, well, that sounds a lot like Adam and Eve there in the garden, doesn't it? Or the attitude of King Saul that led to him being rejected by God. Or the focus of King David as he saw Bathsheba that night and committed sin with her. The motivation of that sinful heart you see in Ananias and Sapphira there in the church as they're lying to the Holy Spirit, it, it's rooted in selfishness. Selfishness leads to sin, and, and ultimately it is a root of sin. And these three pillars of unity, consolation, comfort, and compassion, they just don't exist in the presence of selfishness or conceitedness. They just don't go together. If I'm going to function in these three pillars of unity, I have to let go of selfish ambition and conceit. I have to let go of my, of my selfish desires and my seeking to please self above all. If I'm going to promote the unity of the church by practicing those three things we've seen illustrated. And so I can never be genuinely of aid to someone if I'm actually pursuing selfish motives. Or I can never actually bring true comfort to someone if I'm conceited and seeking my own vain glory. I can never express true compassion when I'm consumed with selfish ambition and conceit. These things just don't function together. And so those who will come into the church and say, well, I know those are the guidelines, but I don't care. It makes me wonder, are they consumed with selfish ambition and conceit? Are they willing to forfeit the pillars of unity just for their own? benefit for their own desire for their own ambition the bible says here we to, to embrace a lowliness of mind many versions of the bible just simply say humility there and that's that's what it's talking about uh, and this is not poor self-esteem this is not uh, the bible's not saying you should look down on yourself and have a poor image of yourself but it's really talking about submitting yourself to the benefit of others that word lowly um in the greek as it was used here was used to describe the most base element of society, like a slave. And so we could, we could almost say uh, taking on a loneliness of mind to esteem others, it's, it's almost like becoming a slave to the best intent of other people. I'm going to be a slave to seeing what is best for other people done. That's, that's kind of what it is to esteem others there, to consider what benefits them instead of focusing on our own comfort, our own desires, or even our own needs sometimes. What is the benefit to those around me? Some of your versions, where, it's, where mine says esteem others, some of your versions say regard others. And that's a proper rendering there, which means to carefully think out what would be involved in doing best for others. Not just, I'm gonna think about what's best for my brother, but I'm gonna carefully think out, how can I do what is best for my brother? Well, in regard to what we're speaking of tonight, we're going to have these COVID-19 safeguards, protocols, and guidelines in place. And the reality is, if I'm carefully thinking out, how can I best do what brings benefit to my church family? Well, I think you'll find it's going to be abiding by these guidelines. That's just kind of how it's going to work. So we should look out for the interest of others, the scripture says here. We should create an atmosphere of caring. I'd like to call it a community of caring within the church. We should promote a community of caring in the church where I'm concerned about your, your interests, your benefit, your well-being, and you're doing the same for me. We care for one another. We care for our community. We care what our community thinks about us caring for one another. Uh, I think this basically means we defer to one another on non-doctrinal issues. And to do that becomes a mark of spiritual maturity. If I can defer to what's best for you, not because it violates the Bible, I'm not gonna to defer to you on a, on a theological issue. I'm not gonna to defer to you if you take a wrong view of doctrine, but on a matter that's not doctrinal, then I defer to you for your benefit. And that's a sign of spiritual maturity. I think we pursue a loneliness of mind. We seek to esteem others. 
We look out for the best interest of others. And as we do that, any disunity or fractures among the church body, they'll filter away because we're promoting those pillars of unity. Brother Dustin, I've gone on a rant and left you out. You want to throw anything in there to any of that? I know I'm talking um, to you in the middle of topics. So yeah, I'll no. I Honestly, uh, I'm good. Um, just, remind, just reminding everybody, I'm putting in the comments, feel free, you're not being rude. Type a question you may have at any time, and I'll ask it to Brother Will sort of where it makes sense in the flow of his lesson. You can ask a question about the guidelines we've talked about, or if he's making a point in the lesson that strikes you, just throw up a question. Now's your chance. So, Very good. Thank you very much. And so we see as Christians we're to promote unity. Um, we're to take on uh, 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 lowliness of mind. We're to let go of selfish ambition and conceit. To, we're to be about the best interest of others. Uh, but I also want you to know Christians really should be understanding. Um, the scripture says here that we should be of one mind. And that refers to actively striving to achieve a common understanding, which leads to a genuine agreement among the body. And so it's not just I'm understanding of you, but it's trying to strive for a common understanding together. But I think part of that involves being understanding towards one another. And specifically in regard to the need for safe and welcoming church environments in the midst of COVID-19, we have to be understanding towards one another because we don't all have the same interpretation of every guideline. We don't have the same uh, feeling or opinion about uh, the seriousness of measures the government has taken and various things like that. We have to deliberately be understanding towards one another at this time. You see, we may not all agree. We may not all agree on which safety measures are needed or what is even reasonable. Um, but we each are responsible for showing an understanding attitude, a compassionate attitude towards one another. We bear that responsibility. And so you may look at our guidelines for coming into worship here, and you may say, you know what, I just don't see the need for masks. But I'm going to be understanding towards the feelings of those others in my church. I'm going to demonstrate a willingness to esteem others and look out for their interests. And so I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to comply. You may not feel that we need a structured seating arrangement, but you say, you know what, but I'm responsible for showing an understanding attitude towards those others who are attending worship with me. And I want to demonstrate a willingness to esteem them and look out for their interests. So I'm going to abide by a structured seating arrangement. You know, you may not even care what people outside the church think about what we're doing. Who cares what the community thinks about what we decide to do? But then you step back and say, well, wait a minute. I'll, I have a responsibility to have an understanding spirit towards those people who are watching the church. And they are friends. And so I want a demonstrating willingness to esteem them and look out for their interests. And so I want to comply because it's for their benefit, not even my own. I'm doing these things to benefit my church family. I'm doing this to benefit those in my community. I'm doing it for others. Because ultimately, I'm going to remember, Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice required to pay for my sins. And in doing that, he was esteeming me better than himself. He was looking out for my interests, not his own. And you know, my friends, none of us are asked to be crucified this Sunday, simply to abide by some inconvenient safety protocols. And so I think that we could probably esteem others better than ourselves, look out for their interests, consider what's best for others and how we could benefit others in a way to honor Jesus, and we could do this. And I think that's what you see in Philippians chapter 2 in this regard. But there's another passage I'd like you to look at, and that's Romans 13. What are we doing on time, my friend? It is 7.37. We're doing all right on time. Romans chapter 13. The first seven verses here, it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. 
but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Here, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, specifically addresses civil authorities and the Christian's responsibility to submit and abide under civil authority. So we see a very clear explanation. Once again, I'm not going to do the text justice and pull out all the in-depth truth just for the sake of time. I'm focusing this more on COVID-19 and our church guidelines. So keep in mind that we're going to miss some pretty important truths you would want to go back and study. But one thing I do want to point out here is that civil leaders are beneficial. The government has been put in place for our benefit. They have been established to provide structure and order in a chaotic world. If you watch the news at all the last few days, you know that chaos ensues in many cities over the last few nights. Just think how much more chaotic it would be if there was no civil organization, no civil form of government in place. God has established government for our benefit to establish order in a chaotic world. And through civil governments, God maintains a degree of order. And that's how to be until the rightful king of kings comes and establishes perfect order under his reign upon the earth. These civil authorities function for our protection to be issuers of justice, to dispense justice and punishment as needed. And what we see here is they work for our benefit. That's at least what I'm seeing here, Brother Dustin. What do you think? Yeah. And so government's just not a random happenstance, but something established by God for our benefit. And understanding this, Christians should submit to civil authorities. We also see here that civil leaders are backed. They got someone who has their back. They have, they have a weighted endorsement. See, govern, government officials have authority because of God's providence. I believe God is the ultimate ruler. He has ultimate control, but he has allowed civil leaders to gain office, to stay in office, and actually work to bring about his purposes. They are established by God's divine providence. What would you say to that, Brother Dustin? That's a very, uh, sometimes a difficult concept because you think about, even when Paul wrote this, they were in an incredibly pagan government, a very totalitarian. And in fact, after the book of Revelation, uh, when Roman history goes on, uh, they had an emperor that was very, very outright persecutive of, of Christians. And then you think of things like Hitler uh, and Stalin. And so sometimes it's, it's a little bit of a question on, well, okay, but are you telling me that God literally wants these leaders to reign? And so, not to get off in the weeds on that, but the point I was sharing with that is, it's not our place to decide what type of government we we will or won't follow and then I think to your point here it's not our place to per se decide well I know the government has asked churches to do this but forget all of that because they don't know what they're talking about or I don't agree with this or that what I read what you read that Paul said here is you have to remember if you do that you're ultimately saying God I don't trust your wisdom mm -hmm. And I don't trust your leadership. Um, Paul didn't say that all of our government leaders are moral Christians. He just said they wouldn't be there if God didn't open the door for them to be there. So there's a reason that they're there. And our job is to set an example and respond in faithfulness. Um, and I'm sure you may be going here, but you know the only time we really disobey is if they were to specifically say to us, you must disobey a direct command of God. But I don't see that they're doing that with mm -hmm. the COVID-19 guidelines. They're saying, hey, for the sake of public health, can you exercise these precautionary measures? Um, so, like, what can you really say no to? Of, I mean, 
They're not saying don't preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. They're not saying you can't open your doors. You, you know, right? I don't know if that's where you're going. No, that's very good. That's very good. Thank you very much. So, uh, with that understanding, Christians see we should submit to civil authority. I mean, that's just how it is. And and we see in this text, Christians abide under civil authority. We're called to obey government authority, to heed laws, to pay taxes, to be good citizens, just to simply be good citizens. We're commanded to maintain a submission to civil authorities for the sake of living peaceful lives and maintaining good and effective witnesses to the lost. That's just part of this. We abide under civil authority, if nothing else, for respect for God. I mean, we abide under civil authority just because God has issued this decree. We're God-fearing people. At least I hope we are. I hope we reverence God. And as such, we want to honor him. And abiding under civil authority is a way to do that. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter says, Submit to those above you for the Lord's sake. If nothing else, to bring honor to God. To bring honor to God. You know, and the reality is, If we abide under civil authority and conduct ourselves as good citizens, we have nothing to fear from civil authorities. Verse 3 points that out, really. And and so children of God want to respect God and honor him, and so we're we're compliant in being good citizens under the governmental agencies that are above us, and that helps us represent him well. That helps us maintain a good witness uh, as a Christian. I'd like to read a quote I wrote down from an author you're familiar with. I'm sure it's, it's MacArthur. Let me read it to you. I'll just get your two cents on it. Here's what MacArthur says. Believers are to be model citizens, known as law-abiding, obedient rather than rebellious, respectful of government rather than demeaning it. We must speak against sin, against injustice, against immorality, against ungodliness, with fearlessness and dedication. But we must do so within the framework of civil law and represent or excuse me and respect the civil authorities i love it of course i'm very biased pro john MacArthur. well i I like how he points out that we do speak against that which is wrong Mm -hmm. but we do it within the framework of civil law in a respectful way and that's not to get in the weeds at all but in addition to covid you and me were talking about this earlier You've got all the protests going on right? Um, due to the other issue with George Floyd. And I, I think, again, not to get off in the weeds, but that is a tragic situation that happened to him. And so, like we were saying earlier, um, you've got to abide with the COVID-19 guidelines and set an example. And now we're a Christian to say, like, man, I, I want to take action with this social injustice I see, but how do I go about it? I think the way John MacArthur said it is perfect. You should call out sin where sin is, and that includes injustices in society. But that doesn't mean we break laws to see change. It doesn't. A Christian has no business, um, as John MacArthur said, we have no business engaging in sinful activity, being civilly disobedient, mm-hmm. um, all for the sake of, well, I'm trying to see change. Well, um, I, I really love how he said that. We should call out those injustices, but do it within the boundaries of honoring God um, and the government. Uh, one quick note, I missed this earlier. Jimmy uh, made a comment back on selfishness. He, he said, selfish sin grieves God so bad that he was uh, sorry that he had made man. So That is true. I just thought that was a good Jimmy Miller comment. always has a good comment to make. That man studies the word. He's in it. Kudos, Jimmy. Well, and that brings me, I wanted just to mention civil disobedience, so that kind of rolled right into the next topic I had Sweet. on my list. You know, because, because, you know, we are obliged as Christians to abide under civil authority in all circumstances unless, as you mentioned, the government commands us to do something in violation of God's word or deliberately forbids us from doing something God commands us to do. That's when we're sideways with the government. Only in that situation. In the Bible, you see examples, and we I don't have time but, uh, to go through all of them, but the Hebrew wi- uh, midwives in Exodus 1 where the Egyptian government said, you must kill baby boys, and they said, no, we won't kill the baby boys. Um, Daniel, he's, he's there. He's a government official under King 
uh, Darius, I believe at the time, the Medes and the Persians, it, it, they passed the law to pray only to the king. Well, the law then was telling Daniel he could not continue to pray to God as he had been directed. So he prayed to God anyway. He disobeyed the law in that. Those are two examples, but you could go back to the, the Daniel and his buddies when they, the king's food. And I mean, there are multiple examples. Acts 5, Acts 5 is a perfect example. And the reality is this. In these instances, the government authorities were directly leading believers to violate tenets of scripture, the truth of God, the law of God. God said, do this. And the government said, no, you won't. You will have to violate God's teaching. That's when they became uh, involved in this civil disobedience when it violated God's law. Um, and even in that, these governments were not defied with violence or malice. These people demonstrated grace and humility in still doing what God had called them to do. In this conflict between the governmental law and God's law, there was still a demonstration of Christian character, the attributes of God himself. Grace and humility. I'm going to tell you, my friends, if it ever comes down to the point where our civil government makes it illegal for us to practice our faith, we'll still have to practice our faith. But we must do so demonstrating the character of Christ with grace and humility, not with violence and malice and discord. You see, we're called to be citizens of the kingdom of Christ first. That's where our allegiance lies. But even in that, we have to represent him well. And in 1 Peter 2, 9, the Bible teaches us that the citizens of the kingdom are called to be a kingdom of priests, not a kingdom of advocates, of protesters, of activists. Anything I would involve myself, politically speaking, personally, would need to be for the sake of the gospel to promote Jesus, to bring honor to him. Now, that means I should use my vote and support those politicians and so forth that would support biblical tenets. But what I mean is as an activist. The only reason I should ever be an activist is because it allows me to promote the gospel or honor Christ. And if it doesn't go that way, and that's why I know what we talked about earlier. If I, mm -hmm. if I can't justify that before the Lord, then why? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so that brings me to this, this concept of religious liberty. I wanted to ask you, we canceled church for several weeks. The government asked us to do so. Mm -hmm. Did they violate our religious liberty with that request? No. Uh, I'll bluntly say not at all because especially here in Arkansas Governor Hutchinson point blank stated on more than one occasion you can go back and look it up in his press conferences he stated these are guidelines they're not directives and he, he also point blank said uh, due to separation of church and state we cannot dictate to a church religious organization house of worship what they do but he said this is what the Department of Health has asked that you do now I do know you know to be fair in, in other states that have not to get political, but a little more liberal leaning governors, they did flex the muscles and they, I believe, um, you've got the Green, uh, Greenville, Mississippi incident. Mm -hmm. um, they were outright blocking, physically hindering churches from uh, carrying out their, their worship services. Um, so they, in some pockets, you know, they could argue mm -hmm. they probably did cross the line, but uh, here within Arkansas, I don't think so at all. Sure, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I, I believe that had restrictions been opposed, imposed upon us based on our theological beliefs or practices, now we have a problem with religious liberty. But we were simply asked to take action that would help safeguard the well-being of our community. And the same request was made of other organizations, be them faith-based or not. It wasn't pinpointed or directed towards us at all. Unfortunately, other, other states experienced Right. conflicts with this um, and so really implementing and abiding by these COVID-19 safety protocols um, that are being recommended for churches by our civil authorities is simply a way for us to demonstrate honor to God as we comply with civil authorities it's a way for us to establish and demonstrate a good Christian witness as model citizens and demonstrate our concern and well-being for the community around us. This is simply an opportunity for us to honor God and develop a great witness among the community when we abide by these things. Now, there's one more passage of Scripture that if we can squeeze it in, I'd really like to. And we'll have to do it quickly. It's Romans 14. In Romans 14, and 
It's uh, verses 1 through 13, and I probably won't take time to read all of them tonight since we are kind of up against the wall, but let me read enough to kind of let you get the gist of it. In chapter 14, beginning of verse 1, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but do not, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Now, that's a key. Not disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another and another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, he eats to the Lord and he gives God thanks and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me stop there, and the next verses are important, but we'll just mention them in passing in a minute. Once again, the third text that we're not pulling all the truth out of, just kind of giving you an overview for COVID-19. Here, Paul speaks to the Christians at Rome and says, look, you need to receive one another and quit disputing over doubtful things, over things that are trivial, that don't really matter, and quit sitting in judgment on one another. You just need to stop. Because judgment doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to us. You see, there are some issues that are not clearly defined and governed in the Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible can I find where it says whether or not I should implement every COVID-19 guideline. I cannot find where it says wear a mask or don't wear a mask. That is not clearly defined. The principle of God's Word applies, as we've seen in Philippians 2 or Romans 13, the principle of God's word applies, but the specific element of concern is not mentioned here. Masks, for example, or social distancing. Here, the example Paul gives, some of these Christians, well, they felt free to eat all meat. It didn't matter. They were liber at liberty in Christ. They had freedom in Christ to eat all of it, and it didn't affect them. Others, concerned with remaining kosher in their diets because of their Hebrew background, they felt they had to refrain from eating the meats. Their personal conscience before God was their guide in that, and they were at peace with God. So you had two groups, one who ate it all, one who didn't eat any. And yet they were both right before God. Neither group was sinful in what they were doing. Each group could conduct their lives as they were led by the Spirit to live honorably before God. Now, Brother Dustin, how could you have two groups of Christians in the same church, one eating meat, one not eating meat, but both justified before God? As long as both were not being sinful about it, then as Paul says here that, that you were reading, it comes down to a matter of conscience. Um, God has given each of us a conscience, and I believe what Paul is getting at at a very practical level is you could have two churches that are in two different cities or they're in two different ministry contexts. They have two different demographics or makeups of congregation. They have two different groups of people who maybe come out of a sinful, different background. So when you take all of those mishmashes of totally different contexts they could exist in, then to me that's how you get, well, one says this way, one says another, and we have to say, well, they're both can be right. They're both doing for them what seems best to them and they both I think I think this is directly answer your question here's how they both can be right if they're both taking the motivation we're trying to honor God and and if they can honestly say that then for them that's right as long as it wasn't you know that's right sinful one or the other. 
if they're seeking to live honorably before God. There's the key. You know, there's the key. The sinfulness is not in eating the meat or not eating the meat. Mm -hmm. The sinfulness comes when I condemn the other. Mm -hmm. When I'm condemning the other group because of what they're doing, because it doesn't fit my interpretation or my practice. That's where the sin comes when I condemn them and become judgmental of them in that. Um, now, this is not a matter of clear biblical teaching. Let me point that out. If, if God's word had said, never eat this meat, then one group have been wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. There's no clear biblical principle, or excuse me, teaching. You have biblical principle you can apply, you pray over, you seek the Holy Spirit's guidance, and then you do what you feel is honorable before God. Mm -hmm. And so that's the case here. You know, um, what was displeasing to God would be their despising attitudes of one another, the condemnation of one another. Um, there are matters, my friends, where there are clearly regulated and clearly defined rights and wrongs in the scriptures. On those matters, we can make definite judgments on what is right and what is wrong. There are other times, though, where a matter is not clearly defined. It is not black and white. And so then we rely upon the spirit of God's law, the contextual principles of Scripture, and we prayerfully seek the Holy Spirit's guidance to determine what would allow us to live honorably before God. And the way I interpret that and live may vary from someone else in that instance. But the judgment of that doesn't belong to me. In fact, judgment belongs to Christ. I didn't go on and read that, but if you continue reading, we find that judgment belongs to Christ and Christ alone. All Christians will stand before Jesus at the Bema seat of Christ. We will give an account of our lives, of our kingdom work and service. Not a determination of salvation, not a judgment of salvation, but a, an examination of our service, an examination of our Christian lives, an examination of how honorably we lived in accordance before God, and then we'll be rewarded accordingly. And so every day the Holy Spirit convicts us and leads us to proper conduct before God. And I may share with you my understanding and my convictions based on the scriptures, and you may share with me a variance based on your understanding of the scriptures. If we're both seeking the Holy Spirit's leadership and we're both seeking to honor God, we may have to agree to disagree on some matters that aren't clearly defined and spelled out, but we can't sit in judgment on one another. Here's what I want you to know, and I'm going to kind of speed this up and just hit some high points because I know you've been listening a long time. Judgment is coming, though. I don't judge you, you don't judge me, but judgment's coming. The scripture says there in verse 5, we should be fully convinced in our own mind. That's referring to the conscience. We should be convinced in our conscience that we are doing what we're doing in a way that is honorable before God. God would approve because judgment will come. We will give an account. That should drive me to be very prayerful, to study the scriptures, to seek this Holy Spirit, to come to a point where I can say in my conscience I'm doing what is right before God I can stand at peace before God with this decision and so that's where we go we do have liberty in Christ we we aren't bound the way uh, some feel we are bound first Corinthians Paul goes in that and we won't go into it tonight but we have liberty in Christ but we have to do everything with good conscience before God and, and to do that, we have to, we have to remove our personal desires, our personal agendas, the influence of culture and world to make sure we're using the scriptures and prayerfully seeking the Holy Spirit to discern what do we do. And in this COVID-19 time with guidelines, these things fall in this. Are you prayerfully seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance to say, God, what should I do that I can live peaceably and have a peace and conscience before you to know here's what I'm doing to maintain the health and well-being of those around me to comply, to be a good citizen? You know, ultimately, faithfulness to Christ, honoring him with the totality of our lives, that's the bottom line. Are you doing that? We have to avoid stumbling blocks. I just want to throw this out, and I'll wrap it up. This passage of Scripture ends by saying uh, there in verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Let me hit on those two things and wrap this up. We must avoid stumbling blocks and causes to fall, the, to use the verbiage there. We have liberty in Christ to discern what is right for us and honorable before God. We don't sit in judgment of other Christians, other churches, and so forth, but we cannot allow any of this to become a hindrance to someone. My liberty in Christ cannot become a stumbling block to you. 
I must avoid that. A stumbling block is something unseen in a path, something that I don't see that I trip over. It's unintentional. I cannot allow my attitude towards COVID-19 to unintentionally become a stumbling block to another person of faith, to hinder their faith, to do anything that would cause them doubt in their faith or to participate in worship. If I do something like that and it's unintentional, when it's discovered, I have to act to remove that stumbling block, to resolve that issue. But it mentions a cause to fall. Now, a cause to fall is something that is placed in someone's path deliberately. It's on purpose. And this would happen when, when I force my views of this situation on you. I say you must comply to how I believe, and I force you to violate your conscience before God. That is a purposeful stumbling, not a stumbling block, a cause to fall. I'm intentionally causing you to stumble in your faith to violate your conscience before God. And so for me to say, I don't believe in mass, so fooey on you. No, 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 no. I, I cannot intentionally lay a cause to fall in front of you. That is wrong of me. I can't expect others to abide by my standards. They must seek the standards they are at peace with before God. And so I want to avoid causing them to sin against their own conscience. Now, that's not mentioned here, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it is mentioned where Paul talks about Christian liberty and when we force someone to abide by our liberties and it violates their conscience before God. We don't have time not to go into that. Just know if you try to require someone who's not at peace with something to abide by what you're at peace with, you're causing them to fall. So in regard to COVID-19 safeguards and protocols, not all churches are doing the same thing. Some churches have already met indoors before we have, and some will meet after we meet, and they'll wait. Some will wear masks, some will not wear masks. Some keep attendance and a track of who set where, and some won't. But we're not going to sit in judgment of any other congregation because it's not our place to do that. And we're not going to care if, what they think about us. We're going to do what we feel at peace with, what we can say I'm at good conscience with before God. We're conducting ourselves honorably before God. So each body of Christ, we have to progress forward as we feel led of the Holy Spirit to conduct ourselves as we feel what is, what is doing, uh, what is best and honorable before God for the community and for our congregation. And so that's how we're going to do things. But in that regard, let's bring it down to a more personal level and then we'll close. If I'm not going to sit in judgment of another church, can I ask you, my friend, not to sit in judgment of other members of your own church? People in our church family, we don't all hold the same view in regard to COVID-19 and in regard to safeguards and protocols. Some people feel that this thing's not even a threat. Other people feel like it's life and death. Some people see no reason to wear a mask. Other people feel you shouldn't leave the house without a mask. Well, look, it's not your place or my place to pass judgment on anyone's belief in this regard. It's our place to love one another, to remove stumbling blocks, to remove those causes to fall, to seek to show compassion to demonstrate comfort, to provide consolation, to esteem others better than ourselves, and to look out for their interests. And so that's what I'm asking you to do, church. Yes, we have restrictions and guidelines we will ask you to abide by Sunday morning. You may not agree with them, and that's okay. You haven't seen me wear a mask at any of our services outside yet, but Sunday morning, I'll have one on. Why? Because that's the protocols we feel best takes care of our congregation. And I'm esteeming others better than myself. I'm looking out for their interests. And so I'm going to abide by the protocols. I'm going to ask you to do the same. And we're going to slowly progress forward. And the Holy Spirit will lead us. And there will be more changes to come. And hopefully we'll get uh, to a point where we're uh, less and less restricted in our worship and gatherings. But church, we love you. Your church staff is working hard for you. Uh, your leadership is doing all that they can do to facilitate worship and gatherings and just outreach and ministry. Hang in there. Keep showing grace. And remember, esteem your brothers and sisters in Christ and look out for their interests.
Thanks for tuning in tonight. Brother Dustin, any final word? Yeah, so we have uh, Jimmy Miller made another comment. The only one we all need to agree on is Jesus and his love and where that love guides and how that love guides us. Um, we had one question. I've, I've asked a couple times. If anyone has any questions, throw them in now. But Brian had a, a procedural question. He asked this. As far as masks go, will face coverings such as a bandana or those neck gaiters, will that be okay or does everyone actually need a mask? That is a good question. And quite honestly, that is not something I remember our leadership team discussing. Do you remember that coming up? No, we did not. I know as far as CDC guidelines go, it actually states, and I, I use one of these myself because I have to wear one to the gym and I actually didn't have a real mask. Uh, Ashley made me sort of a do-it-yourself at home mask the CDC says anything that is 100% cotton, like that type of fabric, would work. Um, I know also uh, where I work, we sold neck gaiters, and some customers are using neck gaiters for their face coverings. So I said all that to say I'm not officially speaking for the church, obviously, because um, we didn't talk about it. But just knowing what I've read from guidelines, um, I think, Brian, a neck gaiter specifically would probably be okay i might wonder about the bandana yeah I that could be a little thin that's that's kind of where i'm falling that's my initial impulse mm -hmm. and initial impulses get you in trouble but i'm going to go with it anyway my initial impulse is a neck gator would be very much sufficient um, bandana i'm not sure of i um, mean that's actually what i started out with yeah. um, because you know when your beard's long you don't want to yeah and brian's gonna have brian's beard, gonna have it so. listen brian what happens is I know from experience, you put the mask on, you get a crease right here in your beard. It's just not good on a man's beard. And it really, I mean, it messes up a man's style. I, I'm sympathetic to you, my friend. I am. Um, I, here's one, and I have an extra, um, and my long-bearded friends, I'll be happy to share. This one, Christy got for me because it doesn't crimp your beard. It sets right across your chin. I have an unused one of these, Brian, if you're interested in that. Um, the used one's broke in, though. The used one is broke in. <laughs> so if you'd like to uh, use the used one, that's okay. Yeah. But good question, Brian. Very yeah. good question. Um, I'm going to say no on the bandana. Yes on the neck gaiter. Um, offer you one of these uh, bearded things if you're interested. Um, I will follow up with our church leadership just to see. But right now, let's just leave it at that um, and see where we fall on it. Good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let's see, Katie Bronze, will we meet on Sunday and Wednesday nights, and when will we start back meeting for Sunday school? Good questions, good questions. Sunday morning only right now. Um, the guidelines are pretty restrictive, um, and if we just feel like it is important to honor those guidelines, and, and uh, just to be honest with you, we can't put everyone, or even half of everyone, in their Sunday school rooms and be compliant with the guidelines. So on-site Sunday school is going to be a ways off. Um, our Sunday school teachers just this week, they're, they're getting the materials. Every one of our classes uh, uh, and preparing to do some type of alternative, whether it's Zoom or mail or Facebook or just text messages. Hey, here's some points I want you to look at in this week's lesson things of that nature so we're, we're our teachers are looking at some alternative method, uh, methods for Sunday school classes to kind of get things uh, rolling or to continue rolling some of them have been going so Sunday school will still be a ways off Wednesday night services we're not conducting right now um, uh, just the restrictions um, we would ha it's just going to be that much more sanitation and that much more uh, uh, work to get things in between services done. Um, that is something, I'm not saying that's off the table, that's something our leadership team can definitely look at doing. Um, but as far as children and youth classes on Wednesday night inside the building, that is something that's posing a great uh, deal of uh, concern and it's a difficult thing for us to see how we can be in compliance. And right now we set a date to resume those, but it's not till September. But Brother Dustin was looking even today at alternatives. 
as far as maybe outside things or this, that, and the other. And I don't want to announce anything because nothing's been determined. But what I want you to know is we're looking at alternative methods to do these things that coming inside for everything isn't just uh, going to be feasible for us. It has to do with facility layout. It has to do with classroom sizes. It has to do with furnishings. There's a lot of different considerations that go into all of this. And when you look at those things compared to all the requirements to be in compliance, it, it, some of these things are just prohibitive. You know, it, it, we just cannot uh, make it work um, just because of facility layout, furnishings, classroom sizes, etc. cetera. It just, it, there's just no way. Um, but we're looking at alternative methods to, to uh, make things happen. This Sunday, coming back inside, this is a big step for us. This is a big jump forward, and uh, you just have to you just have to be patient with us a little bit as we learn how to progress forward. This is all new to everybody, you know. Uh, we're talking to pastors and staff all over the place all the time. We're seeing what other people are doing. They're asking us what we're doing, and every I haven't found any churches that are doing the exact same thing. Every church is doing a little bit different, a little bit different here, and because well, we just all have different setups. We all have different congregations. We just all have different uh, demographics. It's just, it is just a different world for ministry right now. So um, good question, Miss Kathy. And just, I give you my word, we're doing our best to progress forward and, and try to get us back as close to normal as we can. So good question. I think just to add one note, and I think you'd agree with me, we haven't stated this in our leadership meetings, but this is the sense I've felt from all of us. I think we're trying to take a gradual approach, step by mm -hmm. step, adding more and more in-person gatherings, rather than, and again, not saying other churches are wrong for doing this, but if we were to full bore, we're doing, we're back on Wednesday nights, we're back on this, we're back on that, the danger there is, well, something comes up and we got to pull that back. And so, That's right. So now you're kind of like, well, well, we just did it, now we're not. So I think we're rather trying to ease into this slowly so that we're not looking at removing something we just started back. That's so. right. And, and you know, the guidelines are such that if you look at them, they are, I mean, some things are just prohibited. Yeah. For example, children's classes. That's an, one thing that we don't even have an option to try would be that. And I mean, youth, they actually state youth. And youth, like, I mean, like youth is in that. Youth Basically, eight, with the children. 18 and below mm -hmm. ha, has been regulated. They, we cannot offer any of that and be in compliance. Now, we yeah. can offer it and be out of compliance, um, but right now, we, we have prayerfully decided we want to try to be in full compliance. And so, we're just having, we just can't offer those things right now. So, that's just an example, and there's a lot of other things that we could spend all night talking about. But uh, uh, you're welcome. Those guidelines are available online. You can pull them up. And you can read them and see how restrictive they really are. It's much more than what you just hear in the governor's press conference. There's much more to it. <clears throat> Excuse me, much more to it when you actually pull them up and read the specific guidelines. It's much, it's, there's much more specifics involved in those things. But uh, good questions and good comments. Yeah. Just to catch us up on comments. So Brian said back to the face mask so he can just flip his beard. And he'll be good. So, Brian, you know, sure, Brian, whatever. Uh, your wife has made two good comments. People can read it, but I'll announce it publicly. By the way, I'll post this video online so others that couldn't join can see. So I'll post this publicly. But your wife wanted to remind everyone, we will also have masks on hand to give someone who shows up without one. And her follow-up comment is good, and I want to publicly state it. If you are realizing come Sunday that you do not own a mask or you don't have a way to make a mask, do not let that be the reason you don't show up to church. We will provide something for you here. Again, we want you to use what you have because we have a limited number. But if you say, man, I'd love to go to church, but I don't have a mask. Come on anyway, show up. The greeters will provide a mask, right? Yes, and that's that's a good point. Uh, we, have, we have greeters. In fact, there's a training for those guys coming up so they'll know exactly what the guidelines are and how to abide by them and what to look for. But that's part of our new greeter policy right something new that in this who would have ever thought your greeters would have had to been checking people to see if they had a mask but that's the world we're in right now and so the greeters will direct you um, and provide you with a mask if you cannot get a mask so yes by all means please come and uh, we'll we'll take care of that now you know if a hundred of you show up without a mask we'll be in trouble but you know 
That's okay. We'll make it yeah. work. Brian said the used mask you offer, uh, we offered is tempting, but he's, <laughs> he's not sure. But he says they all have a mask. Uh, Jimmy Miller asked a question, what about Vacation Bible School? Okay, Jimmy. Good question. Bible school is a great outreach. In fact, when a church does Bible school correctly, it becomes the largest evangelical outreach you'll do the entire year. I love Bible school, and it's so important. The reality is, Bible school is listed by name in the government's guidelines for day camps. The day camp guidelines far exceed what church guidelines are. They are super restrictive. We have pulled those guidelines out. We've looked them over. We have looked at various uh, just modifications of Bible school that how could we do this, how could we do that. We came up with one or two models that are feasible but not practical. And after looking at all that's involved and the reality that they are actual um, – directives not guidelines they are directives they are law if we don't abide by them perfectly we are in violation of state law there's and, liability and then we're open for lawsuits yes. and so on and so on so having said all that bible school as we have known it isn't a possibility but we have found some options that would allow us to engage families in a bible school just not on site here, and we're looking into those. In fact, uh, um, Sandra and the Bible School team, they've got that information. They've been previewing the stuff, looking it over to see how possible it is to get that and use it this summer. And so we're looking for an alternative Bible School. And that's what I would plan on having. I don't know the specifics yet, but I would expect we're gonna do an alternative Bible School that would involve some virtual learning um, some virtual, uh, basically you would log in with your kids. The church would provide certain access to certain curriculums and you would go on, you'd have activities and so on and so forth. That's kind of what we've been looking at. That's not a for sure thing yet. Once again, it's in the hands of our Bible school uh, team and Sandra's looking it over. So good question. Bible school on site, traditional style, isn't not a possibility, but an alternative to Bible school is and we're looking at how can we make that work? And that's high on our priority list to do something like that. So we'll have something in some form, I'm sure. We're getting some good questions. Yes. Um, it comes down to on Vacation Bible School, it's really sad, but just to give you perspective, Jimmy, or anyone who's wondering, there's a reason all the camps that I know of have canceled. Right. And you say to yourself, well, but the governor said that uh, summer camps could happen. They can, but, you know, there's like this much chance that you can actually adhere to the guidelines they've put in place. And VBS is lumped right in there. Can you? Can we have VBS? We could, but when you look at all the restrictions and you look at the size of our spacing and what all that would take, you say, actually, no, we, we can't do it and actually do it right. Um, That's right. And, and there's one thing that I really want you to, to keep in mind, everybody. A lot of this, we bear a responsibility to maintain a stellar Christian witness, to be above reproach as a church. And so if we try to push through an event like a Bible school and bring in kids from the community and someone were to get sick, we have just damaged our reputation in the community immensely. Mm -hmm. We have hurt our witness, and I don't know how you would repair that. And so we have to be considerate of those things as well. You know, we're going to do as much as we can, but the reality is we're not going to, uh, I just saw a funny picture, Brother Dustin had on his picture. Don't look at it yet. Um, uh, we're going to do all we can do to be active in ministry, but to also maintain the guidelines, be in compliance so that we can say we've been above reproach and not put anyone in harm's way so that we can maintain a stellar Christian witness. Um, so that's a very, very important thing we've been trying to do. But very good, very good questions, very good comments there. Um, very good engagement. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's see. Miss um, Kathy asked, 
Are we going to be checking temperatures? I'm assuming she means at the door when people show up. That is not on our list that of things we are going to actually do. Um, we are going to ask people to be aware of their temperature, and if they are running a temperature or believe they might be running a temperature, to uh, just avoid in entering our facility. And that's part of the signage that we'll post. Uh, you know, if you if you have run a temperature, if you've shown any symptoms of illness and so forth. And so that's part of the uh, kind of the guidelines we're going to ask everyone to police themselves on before coming, really. That's part of the preparation for coming to church. Be mindful. Does someone in your family have a fever? Do the, are they showing symptoms of illness? Well, in that case, would you please stay home? But in reality, even before COVID-19, we would have told you the same thing. You know, just be respectful of the health of those around you and your church family. And so we're not going to have one of those little deals to run across your forehead and stop you at the door. Uh, we're just going to, we're, we're in good faith going to trust. You're going to be compassionate towards an, uh, people enough to know, well, if you're, if you're running a fever, just, you're just not going to come. So good question. So that'll be a self-check policy. Yes. Not an official check. Self-check. Yeah, self self check. Now, um, listen, if you're going to self check, don't be using one of those rectal thermometers there. That's no. the that's the most accurate. It is so the most accurate. If you want to know, you got to use you got to use it. Your wife said they just went outside and saw a rainbow, and then she also says for me to announce. So please, everyone, invite your friends and family. We're eager to be welcoming to our community, and our loved ones. And Jimmy Miller says, Amen. Amen. That's all the questions and things we have. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to kind of end it up with. It no, looks sir. Like, uh, people have been kind of dropping out anyway, so <laughs> you can see the blue line trailing there. Uh, but, hey, thank you. Thank you all for hanging with us uh, for tonight, letting Brother Will explain the biblical principles and your questions. I'll say this. If you didn't get a question answered or you think of something later, send it to us in Facebook. You can private message us on, through our Facebook page. Um, or send a comment through the YouTube video. I'll make sure and get that to Brother Will, and he'll either direct message you or we'll probably throw up a short video or something if we get enough of them. So please don't feel like you got left out. You have anything else? No, that's very good. Thank you, okay. for, thank you for lending me your time tonight. Hey, this is all about you, man. It's all about you. Yeah. So um, we'll end on that. Thank you all. And as we go, I want to give a shout-out to Leah Miller and Hannah Rowlett and Shelby. Uh, they're in a little group text. And they were texting me as they're listening, as they're listening and watching, but they're apparently adding some filters to Brother Will and I as they're watching. So as we close out this night, thank you for watching, and I will throw up one of their famous photos that they sent me while watching tonight's lesson. Thank you all, and peace.